talking guns. Now, last week I started this segment with Stand Your Ground, Connecticut. Many are watching and waiting, and as we've learned before, gun control measures do not work. In the case of the Newtown Massacre, the gun-free zone left students as easy targets for potential assailants. Assault weapon bans fail to ban assaults. And while the law restricts law-abiding citizens, the criminals can seek out firearms and commit crimes. On January 1, 2014, tens of thousands of Connecticut gun owners became Class D felons. Now they're engaging in full civil disobedience. And to talk about that with me, I'm honored to have three special folks from Connecticut, Ed Peruta from Connecticut Gun Rights, Rich Burgess from Connecticut Carry, and Rachel Barrett, a Connecticut gun rights attorney. I want to welcome all three of you. How are you today? Hi, Kate. Hi. Now, hey, who was that? How are you? you got to define voices for me. Ed, say hi. Hi, Kate. How are you? Very good. And Rich. Hey, Kate, how are you? Very good. Now, see, we've defined your voices, and Rachel, we'll be able to pick you right out, won't we? Well, thank you, Kate. Good good afternoon. It's an absolute pleasure. It's actually still morning here in Arizona. Oh, no. It's, I know, it's oh, afternoon here in Connecticut don't, already. Don't worry about it. We're, we're good to go. We're always <laughs> yeah, confused out here. It's 76 <laughs> degrees in Phoenix. <laughs> yes, and that's why we're in Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if you'll note, I have a New England accent, so I do know what a shovel is. And it isn't for just other things like manure. But nonetheless, there's a lot of manure going on in Connecticut right now. Am I right? And Ed is the best one to tell you about that. All right, Ed, let's hit you up first. Talk to us. Kate, first of all, first of all, I'd like to thank you and all your listeners for giving us an opportunity to tell you what's going on in the unconstitution state. If we um, if we do I, not stand with you, we could be next, and that is my well. From what I from what I understand, you know, because of the media attention that Connecticut Carry has gotten recently with a with a press release, uh, there's been a lot of people from around the country that have been contacting mm-hmm. us through Rich. But if I could take probably thirty seconds just to because I know time is of the go for it. here, but something I'd like to say to your readers. The state of Connecticut is now faced with three options with this new law. Enforce it, amend it, or repeal it. No Mm. exceptions. It's without question that a known group of Connecticut politicians from both political parties realized that an emotional tsunami wave existed where they could, for a brief time after the Newtown incident, grab their political surfboards, and ride the public outrage and grief of Sandy Hook Mm -hmm. uh, to push forward and obtain their personal political goals to disarm and infringe upon the constitutional rights of law-abiding citizens in Connecticut. The political surfers, with no concern for the rights of law-abiding Connecticut residents, intentionally took advantage of the Newtown tragedy by emergency certification of the law Mm -hmm. with the knowledge that time and public opinion would be against them if they waited to subject the proposal proposed legislation to the normal legislative process almost done those opposed to federal and state constitutional rights knew that public hearings and public debate would if allowed to take place expose the problems that currently exist with the newly enacted laws. One can safely say that they had the attitude, enact it now while emotions are high and deal with any problems with the law in the future. Regardless of the reasons, Governor Malloy had in signing the 2013 legislation uh, made law-abiding citizens Criminals who did not declare possession of their newly prohibited firearms felons. And Kate, it's not just a Second Amendment issue. No. The First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Eighth Amendment, and obviously the Fourteenth Amendment are in play in almost everything that's happening here in Connecticut. And in and jeopardy. I've said my I've said my piece to all of your <laughs> listeners. I'm I'm I have a website, Connecticut Gun Rights, ctgunrights.com. 
I am a director for Connecticut Carry with Rich. Rich is the passionate one. No. I'm the one that gets in trouble for my mouth and tells Rich <laughs> to put quotes around what I say. Okay. And Rachel is and Rachel is the attorney who picks up the pieces for everybody who has law enforcement knocking at the door. Okay, now I want you all to hold that thought because I'm going to have you come in and we're going to do a full long segment. I just wanted to take a moment to introduce you, but you did a good job there. Thank you very much. Now, for those of you out there who are listening, this is Kate Kruger Talking Guns, and I have three rather outspoken guests about what's going on in Connecticut because they are on the front lines. And it's a very important message that they have to bring to you. Um, so if you miss any of this show today, you know you can go to the guns at the website. Yeah, the gun site. Go to the website at kktgradio.com to catch the archives. Uh, I want you to make sure that you uh, sign up for newsletters because it's going to let you know who's going to be on the show in upcoming weeks, where I'm going to be speaking, articles, and every once in a while when I get five minutes, I do a quick gun review. Thanks to a lot of folks out there uh, this week uh, in getting – my guests on, but also all the folks from Connecticut that you three generated that hit my Facebook, my website, they've been downloading my show. I want to thank all of you and a big shout out to those folks in Connecticut and a big thanks to you three as well. Um, the, the numbers have gone crazy once they knew you guys were going to be on the air. Uh, today I was joined by Sheriff Richard Mack. He's a speaker. He's the author of The County Sheriff, The Last American Hope. Shane Krauser, also a radio show host here at KFNX and a constitutionalist. But these three folks, Ed Peruta, Rich Burgess, and Rachel Barrett, are going to be with me for the next half of this half of the show. And then I'm going to end up with Alan Corwin, last but not least. This is Kate Kruger. You stay with me. I've got more show to go. You're listening to Talking Guns with your host, Kate Kruger. This is Kate Kruger, and I'm Talking Guns, and I have got three folks Right from the front lines of Connecticut, Rich Burgess, he is the president of Connecticut Carry, Rachel Baird, and a Connecticut gun rights attorney, and, of course, Ed Peruda. I put you last this time, Connecticut gun rights, only because you already said a lot. I want to hear what Rich has to say. You're supposed to be the passionate one, Rich. So what does this mean to you? And what do you all I, – I think the question everybody begs is, what do you all believe – or what do you all think about the civil disobedience? Because it is a large case of civil disobedience. Rich, let's start we with are, you. We obviously support anybody who wants to be civilly disobedient. Um, the, these laws are no laws at all. We, we believe that you know, if people are going to have individual rights, then those individual rights mean something. And to, to disobey these kind of unjust laws, it, it's just another another part of the long line of disobeying tyrants. Mm-hmm. However, there's there's a lot to be said for it as well. Where we need to, as Connecticut Terry, we need to try to defend these people if they get into trouble, and that's really the greater part of that. It's it's easy to say that we're going to disobey laws, but we need to have a, a support network set up for these people. Mm-hmm. I I read your interesting quote, and I loved your quote actually. As citizens of Connecticut, we have a right to bear arms. With that right comes responsibility, the responsibility to stand in defense of ourselves and our fellow citizens is paramount, and it is so true. The other responsibility is to stand against tyranny, in my words. Um, and I believe that that is what Connecticut is doing, is you are standing against tyranny. And that is one of the most important pieces of the Second Amendment that I believe in. Right. Rights don't mean anything if you're not willing to to protect them and to actually utilize them. And that is correct. And and you're you're just um, standing up in a great line of uh, historians. Uh, you're standing up for the rights and freedoms of this country. And as Ed so aptly put it, it isn't just about the Second Amendment. It happens to be the forefront of the problem, but it is not just about the Second Amendment. Um, when right. all the lo- it's about individual rights. Right. When all the meetings, and there were meetings because I talked to um, um, Joyce Rubino from Colt and I talked to Mark Makowski of STAG on the air, and they went and tried to fight for this, a fight against this as well, and they were virtually ignored. Sure. They were at the legislative office building. I mean, mm-hmm. I saw them there. We talked. Busloads, uh, too. You know, right. Colt did a very, a very good power move bringing in busloads of their workers that they just packed the entire place. They chanted. They held up signs. That was great. And, mm-hmm. you know, we had so many gun owners 
a lot of people really believe that, you know, Connecticut just took this laying down. But we had thousands of gun owners inside the legislative office building. We, we stayed till late hours trying to, you know, speak our piece. And all they did was just shut us down by doing the emergency certification at the last minute. Mm-hmm. They didn't get anywhere with any of the bills. All the bills that had been presented before then that actually had public commentary were pretty much shut down right away. All the legislators, you know, they said they would be crazy to, to try to vote on them considering the reaction. They didn't but want then to they hear went ahead and Right. Then they went ahead and did it pretty much overnight. So, Rachel, your perspective on this? Well, my perspective is this, Kate. I, I, when, whenever a law doesn't make sense to me, um, civil be- disobedience is one thing, and, um, you know, Rich and, and Ed support that. But from my point of view, when I see a law that doesn't make sense, I look at that law. I look at how it was passed. Mm-hmm. I look at it in its context of other laws, and I use my legal knowledge and skills to try to find a hole in that law because if a law doesn't make sense, then oftentimes there are holes in it that make it unenforceable. And that's what I look at as my job. And I'd like to give you one example if you have a minute. Sure. This is one example. A gentleman came to me about a year ago, um, right after these laws were passed. So it was less than a year ago. And he said, you know, I, I had an assault weapon, and I got a letter from the state police saying that I had to turn it over to a federal firearms licensee. And because there was an ex parte restraining order against him. Now, what an ex parte restraining order is, is nothing's been proven in court. Somebody's just made a complaint about you, and you have 14 days to have a hearing. And then at that 14 days, you get a hearing, and then a judge enters an order or not. And he said, well, there was an ex parte restraining order, and I gave up my firearm because they said I had to or be subject to criminal penalties. And then when the 14 days came up, nobody showed up to prosecute this. The order just dropped, and an actual order was never, ever entered after a hearing. And I said, well, that doesn't sound right. And between the time when he had given up his assault weapon and the time when he was eligible to get it back, the laws had changed, so it could no longer be transferred back to him. So he lost his assault weapon. And when I looked at this, I discovered that the state police, for nearly 10 years, I believe, have been sending out letters to people subject to these temporary orders, these ex parte restraining orders, saying that you have to give up your firearms. Well, that's not true at all. Under Mm -hmm. federal law and state law, it's not until a judge actually has a hearing and enters that order that you have to give up your firearms. And so the state police ended up changing their policy. They don't send letters like that out anymore. But this gentleman can't get his assault weapons back because, unfortunately, he followed that. And that's the kind of thing I'm doing with the new laws. I'm looking at them all together, and I'm attempting to find holes in those laws because of the way they were rushed through. And we are finding some holes in those laws. And I do the same thing when I defend people who are charged Mm -hmm. with uh, laws involving firearms. We attempt to find the holes in them to save one individual at a time, and then through doing that, provide others the means to make their case and their arguments as well. So that's what I look at as my role in in, uh, working with Rich and working with Ed and and working with other people on firearms issues. But it takes that kind of person in the background. It takes a lot of passion up front, a lot of um, public... to stand up in the in front of the public and to make these passionate speeches and to get the motivation and the folks behind you. I think that's happening in Connecticut, and that's why you're seeing all the other states stepping up to stand with Connecticut. Uh, I love the Facebook pitches of Stand Your Ground Connecticut with good patriots across the country holding their gun and a sign, Stand Your Ground Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a huge, passionate movement. It means a whole lot to a whole lot of good Americans. And the irony is, is a lot of the gun owners are missing the fact that there's so much more engaged in this than the Second Amendment. And oh, the Fourth Amendment especially. I mean, that's a, mm-hmm. that's an issue I run into constantly, the the invasions of people's homes and the right. taking of their property. And right. simply because it's firearms, everybody thinks it's okay. If it were anything else, it wouldn't be okay. First Amendment as well, when they didn't, when, when you had all these meetings and they they didn't care. They didn't care. They shut it down and pushed the law. And the First Amendment goes even further. I have people that say things, for example, uh, a case that Rich followed closely where a gentleman hadn't gotten his medical records, couldn't have his surgery, called up 
doctor's office and said, you know, if I don't get those medical records, I'm going to come down there and it won't be pretty. Mm -hmm. Now, many professionals receive frustrated phone calls from people all the time. And um, there, it's, we did a Google search of it won't be pretty, and President Obama has said it in his speeches. It's, it won't be pretty. But because this gentleman was on record as owning a firearm, they came to his house and they took his firearms. So if you own firearms, you have to be careful what you say in Connecticut. You cannot speak like other people because if it's taken wrongly or seen as too aggressive, the police will be at your house to take your firearms. See, that's what people don't understand. Uh, there are still states. Uh, gun registration is 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 the the bane of every gun owner. It puts you. It puts a target on your back, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And and these governments are not afraid to use them. I mean, look at what New York did to the concealed carry folks uh, in Upper State New York, where they released the list of names, mm-hmm. and some mm-hmm. of the people on those lists were people who had restraining orders. And all of a sudden, the bad guy who they had a restraining order against knew where they were. Name, address, phone number, you name it, they got it. Um, it the irresponsibility of these governments are, is just incredible. And we allowed it. We allowed it. I mean, I don't care. Slice and dice it. We allowed them to get this powerful. Now we're going to have to work twice as hard to stand with everybody and fight back. Um, you know, Ed... You you made a, a pretty, pretty impassioned uh, story at the beginning. What are folks doing in Connecticut? Who are the folks in the trenches doing the heavy lifting? Well, there, obviously, I, I have to give a lot of credit to Connecticut Carey and Rich Burgess. Um, we, as an organization, put on seminars. Uh, we've had Rachel Baird uh, participate in What Do You Do When They're At Your Door?, and we came up with a list of, of do's and don'ts. You almost have to have an emergency plan in your house. Um, there is an organization called Connecticut Citizens Defense League in Connecticut. Um, there are various sportsmen's organizations, but I think I can explain it best like this. There's several different areas of owners of firearms in Connecticut. You have your sportsmen. You have your competitive recreational shooters. You have your collectors and your investors in firearms. You have the people that uh, possess firearms for personal protection, self-defense. And then you have the criminals. That, that is a group of people that have firearms that's not going to listen to the law one way or the other. And because I'm the legal investigator for Attorney Baird, um, we get to see clients or prospective clients walk in, put their documents up on the table, tell their stories, and firearms laws in Connecticut are like a big jigsaw puzzle. Oh yeah. If you're properly trained, if you're properly trained and you know how they all fit together, you can go through life with no problems. Right. Right. Um, but a lot of people are are trained in safety, but not trained in the law or how to respond or how to act. Right. And Rich Burgess uh, put on, Connecticut Carey put on a seminar in a blizzard last year, last winter. And people showed up, and we did, because Connecticut is one of the only states that has what's called the report your neighbor law or the risk warrant. Where I got another name for that. You know that, don't you? <laughs> no, anyway. what's your name for it? No, Kate? no, no. <laughs> no, it doesn't, I it's actually, not over broadcast. I, I actually read history, and I understand what his historical significance that has. Um, so for those of you who don't read history, go out and read about Report Your Neighbor. Uh, well, not yeah, not a and, good thing. And, and what happened was, in a blizzard, we had people show up, and the seminar was very well received. Um, I'd like to ask your viewers that if they could find the time and the resources Contribute to the NRA, contribute to your various national, state, and local uh, firearms mm-hmm. groups. Um, but what happened in Connecticut, Kate, was this. Nobody was on the same page until this 2013 legislation. Mm-hmm. Then it took the hunters who really didn't care about the handguns or the people with handguns who really didn't hunt 
or the collectors who just collected and never took them outside of their vault. And I think that's, and, that's and kind it, of always our problem, Ed. And I got two minutes and I do want to let Rich speak for a second. But it's kind of always our problem as gun owners is we tend to look at each other as sportsmen, self-defense, this and that. We are gun owners. Period. And Yes. I, and an Law assault, and, that owners. is correct. And assault weapons is not a natural term. I got a baseball bat that I can use as an assault weapon. So I really hate that terminology because they're firearms. We are gun owners. We I'd are like, Second Amendment supporters. I'd like, to use, I, I'd like to use your program to ask people to visit ConnecticutCarry.com and if they can support uh, financially or otherwise what we're doing here in Connecticut. We're going to need all the help we can get. To help and we will make that sure that we push that out. Door. Rich, last word. I will give you the last word, sir. We've got about oh. a minute and a half. Okay. But I think it really uh, hit some of the great points for us, so I'll use my time to say uh, thank you to your listeners, thank you to you, uh, and thank you to people all across the country who have been showing incredible support to us. Uh, our phone, email, all our social media is just flooded with people showing their support. We've been receiving donations from across the country. Uh, it's been great, and it's really good for us, you know, as, as Connecticut Carry leadership, but also our members to see that so many people are out there supporting our cause. It's, so thank you. I have to tell you, Rich, it's the most important thing, as far as I'm concerned, out there today, because without you, everybody's watching Connecticut. What happens there could conceivably happen everywhere, and if it's, if it's a good thing, then it's great. It's a healing process. And if it's bad, it's a disease that could spread. And we need you guys and we need your strength in the trenches. And I will be happy to continue speaking about this. Um, I actually have uh, Scott Wilson on next week as well. We're going to continue this fight for Connecticut with all of you. And at any point, I know that there is a big rally coming up April 5th. And our friend David Codria and our Talking Guns contributor is going to be a featured speaker there. And he is a great Second Amendment patriot. So stand. You're on our mailing list, Kate. Thank, Thank you. You, Kate. you, you bye got bye. my number. Thank you very much. This is Kate Kruger talking guns. You stay with me. I do have more show to go, and I'm very excited. Take care. <laughs>